Port is open both to people from the east and west to travel there. Theologians who are studying the event there feel that is one reason the Madonna, if she in fact is appearing there, selected this area because it would be something that would be open to people of both ideologies. Mm -hmm. And the message that the Madonna is delivering to these children is a message of peace. Mm -hmm. To find peace within yourself through God and therefore find peace so among the nations. Been, it could have been kids anywhere. But this yeah. place was a significant place. Because as you say, it's, it's sort of a crossroads. Mm -hmm. It's right in the middle of this. And yet the communists, although they control it, apparently don't control this part of it uh, that tightly. Well, they do control they? it very tightly. Uh, yes. They have tried, the government tried in the beginning, and uh, we should say these apparitions just began in 1981. Um, almost five and a half years they've been going on now. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, the, the government tried very hard to control them, in fact, to stop them. Uh, this is an area that, for those who are not familiar with, with Yugoslavian history at all, is an area where three separate religious ideologies exist. Uh, the Croatian Catholics, the Serbian Orthodox, and the, um, the Muslims live there. And it's always been an area of extreme sociological tension as a result. And there has, for, long, for a long period of time, especially since the communist takeover at the end of World War II, been an area where the Croatians have been very rebellious. They, they wanted their independence. And they were afraid, because of the large number of people gathering around these apparitions, that it would be a seed for some sort of rebellion. And they tried very hard to, to quell them. Mary Lou, did you ever think why, why these kids? Why these particular yeah. children? Yeah. I think it had a lot to do with the area they were living in. Mm -hmm. um, I think in all the cases of apparition, we've seen that it's been in foreign countries like this. It's been in rural areas, and usually with young children who are not rich children. They're very pious, young, uh, rather poor kids. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people ask, well, why children? Mm -hmm. Why not? Why not? Mm -hmm. But also, I think it's because children are very innocent. They are less prone to tell extreme lies and they don't have the background to make up a story like this and and they usually stick to their guns mm -hmm. we have uh, throughout this program we're going to be showing some pieces of uh, footage and you've been talking about the kids uh, you want to set up the first one jim and what we're about to see is there originally were six children that uh, were seeing the apparition two of those six have since seen all their uh, heard all their secrets that they are being given ten secrets for each child mm -hmm. They no longer receive apparitions. One of the six is in military duty now and in the northern part of the country sees apparitions in the home of a friend. At least three actually still in the village of Medjugorje. One of those, Vitska, is ill with an inoperable brain tumor and because of that often receives her apparitions at home because she's too sick to leave. That leaves two children that during the period of time that we were there actually went into the room of apparitions where they have these apparitions each night. What we're going to show you now are those two children. This is Jakob Cholo, who is now 16 years old, and uh, Maria Pavlovic, who I think is 19 or 20. I'm not sure exactly of her age. But uh, this is an actual apparition about to begin. They come up and they pray two decants of the rosary. And, uh, and then the apparition will begin. You'll see as soon as it begins, as soon as they see the Virgin Mary appearing, they will instantly fall to their knees. And once that happens, they become almost trance-like. There they go. And you'll notice that they are, when they are talking, they will make no sounds. They have had scientists come in, read their lips, try to read their lips, and they've discovered that they're not speaking in any language that uh, they can discern. There's no modern known language that they're speaking. But, but are they saying something now? Yes, if you look closely, you can see, yeah. uh, I think, Yako's mouth moving there. He is actually their speaking. Their lips move intermittently, and as you can see, their eyes are, are riveted in the same place. They at one time tested all six of the children with uh, electrodes over their eyes, and they found out that once the apparition begins, all the six children's eyes would lock on an identical yeah. same spot with, in less than two-tenths of a second. Yeah. So it's almost instantaneous that they... Uh, and I think what happens is they're, they're looking at her and speaking with her as they would any other human being. And when you do hear them speak out loud, they're speaking in Croatian. Now what they actually are doing is reciting prayers yeah. with the Madonna in Croatian. But yeah. when they are actually conversing with her, they make no sound. And, and, and the this is rather extraordinary because I, 
the fact that, that we had the cameras yeah. in that room. That is quite unusual since we were really the only, the yeah. BBC was the first actual news team to get in there, but we are the first news team from the United from the States, States. Mm -hmm. uh, to how, get in there. How did you all feel about being in that room with these children? How did you feel? You know, that's one of the interesting parts and one of the interesting Because everybody wants to know that. Yeah. That we hear about. Um, we, had, we had talked to a number of people before we left that had been there before mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And one thing they had told us is as soon as you step off the bus in Medjugorje, you'll feel this overwhelming feeling of peace. And when you're in the room of apparitions, if you're fortunate enough to get in there, you'll feel the presence of mm -hmm. Madonna. We went in there. The, the tape you just saw was on a Monday night. We arrived on a Sunday. That mm -hmm. was Monday night. And uh, we walked in, and as you saw, we were we were kind of busy doing yeah. reporterish things, taking pictures and observing and, and keeping our eyes on what was going on. So, so it's not really it's not really fair to compare how we felt in the apparition in the first night mm -hmm. with what other people feel because we were doing a job. Uh -huh. and Did you go back there more than once? Twice. Twice. Uh -huh. Yes. yes. And, and the second time that you were there. You were not uh, you were not necessarily involved in the story, but you were there feeling. Yeah, I think we felt a little more the second time because by that time the end of the week had approached. We were leaving the next day, and most of our work had been completed by then. And I think we were a little a little easier. It was easier for us to relax at that okay, time. Uh, take advantage of the situation. We're going to take a break now, and in just a moment, when we come back, we will find out how reporters remain objective in a story that is so very, very deep. Back at just a minute on Newsmaker. Back on Newsmaker, a very special Newsmaker today. The subject is the miracle of Medjugorje. And our guests are two reporters, Jim Bailey and Mary Lou McCall. It's real funny for Jim Bailey to be sitting over there. I, I, I think I'm going to be saying, and with us is our managing editor, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm doing this thing. And we, we just saw a, a moment ago, uh, a really uh, exciting uh, piece of the, uh, of the special mm -hmm. uh, where the young kids um, uh, see what they say is the vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, before we left, I, I told the, the folks that I would ask you, and when we came back, ask you both, how reporters remain objective when they're doing a story like this, a story that has so much feeling in it? How, how do you, how do you, keep that objectivity? I think you keep the objectivity the same way you keep it in any other story that you cover. I think that as reporters we are trained to remain objective and to go out and seek the facts and present the facts to the public. I think that's our duty. And I think that's what Jim and I did in this case. We went, we uh, searched out the facts as best we could in this situation because it's a very difficult story to cover. There is nothing that you can really investigate and prove wrong or prove correct because even the Catholic Church can't do that how immediately. Can you, how can you prove Right. But I think what we have done is present the facts as we learn them. That doesn't mean we don't feel about the story. That doesn't mean it doesn't have a, an impact on us personally. Every story I think we cover, special, especially emotional stories like mm -hmm. this one, fires, deaths, uh, anything of, of that nature has an impact us on us personally, but I think it is our duty to just present the facts and let the public decide, and I think that's what we've done. It has impacted us personally, but I think we've tried to keep that back because that's our responsibility. And I wanted to hear from you on that as well, Jim, because that's a question that, uh, that uh, troubles all good reporters. Mm -hmm. uh, when they're on a story, they've got to keep that objectivity. H how about you? How did it Man, work? Mary is absolutely right. You're, you're trained to do that, and I think to assume that only a, a story like this is going to impact you is false. Every story you do, if you realize that it impacts on people's lives, has to have some impact on you. You have to realize, and if you lose, ever lose sight of the fact that what you're dealing with is in fact people's lives and the way news mm -hmm. affects them, then you're probably not doing your job because you're not looking at what, you know, what is actually the impact of the news. So every Every story, I think, impacts on a reporter in some way or another, but you still have to be able to detach yourself, and you are able to do that, even in a situation that is as emotionally charged as this, mm -hmm. because realistically, if what in fact is happening over there is true, then this is probably one of the most amazing stories of the century. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's things the like amazing, this, just the, the amazing story. The most the amazing. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I think a good reporter not only can 
search out the facts, but also have compassion for what they're doing. And I think that's very important. And I think we did have compassion in this mm -hmm. case. And I think it was important, and I think it was appropriate in this case. And of course, what we did here, in, in addition to telling the story and letting the people see it, mm -hmm. we, we went to uh, the church, mm -hmm. and we asked the church, you've looked at it, what's your feeling about it? Uh, you you yeah. asked theologians. But you know, the other thing was, um, I know we were chided by some of the press for not investigating this and not contacting the quote-unquote ghostbusters. Well, we did. We contacted a group in New York that is, um, has, has deemed itself responsible for searching out fact or fiction stories like this one. They hadn't even heard of this. Mm -hmm. Most of the country hasn't heard of Medjugorje. Okay. You know, we are on the top of this story. It's been going on for five years, but in the United States. Channel 8 is the first station to attempt to even and discover what's going on over there. So it's very difficult to set out to prove or disprove this. Yeah. And, and even with, with events like this that the church has in some way sanctioned, they never come out and, and conclude that yes, this is a factor. What they will do is say, we can find no evidence that it is not. Mm -hmm. And that is what we researched and that's what we did both from a scientific and, and, with you. and theological standpoint. I don't think it was our responsibility to decide whether or not it was true or false. I think no, it was a just, tremendous story. Story. It is a people's story. It is a, a story of tremendous importance, and it was our responsibility to go there and let people Here know what's take going a look on. At it. You let people judge for themselves. We did exactly what we set out to do. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, uh, another uh, fantastic part of this special has to do with the segment called "The Miracle of the Sun." Uh, set that up for us, Susan. Yeah. Miracle of the Sun. There are a number of miracles that are occurring over there. Uh, that people see, in addition to what only the children actually see the Madonna, uh, or claim to see the Madonna. The rest of the pilgrims that go over there do witness a number of called miraculous events themselves, one of which is the changes that take place in, in the midday sun. Mm -hmm. uh, we witnessed that at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and what we are about to see now is a segment of the series that we ran earlier that uh, in which Mary Lou McCall absolutely <laughs> blows her cool while she is watching this. <laughs> That's what this is. Okay. While the visionaries are the only people who claim to see the Madonna, each day hundreds of pilgrims report other miracles. I had the privilege of seeing the chalice and the Eucharist, and I saw the heart, and I saw one tremendous heart just pulsating, pulsating, pulsating. It was very, very touching. High atop the mountain of apparitions where the Madonna apparently first appeared to the children, people are seeing many unusual events. That is where photographer John Fritzinger, Jim, and myself witnessed an extraordinary phenomena called the miracle of the sun. We stared directly into the sun for at least 15 minutes without hurting our eyes. As we describe the scene, you will be watching an artist's recreation of what happened. It's as though a disc is slipped in front of the sun to protect your eyes, and all around the sides of the disc, like in an eclipse, different colors just keep coming out. It's a bright white now, almost a purplish white all around it. There's like a, a gold rim around the sun right now, and, and it seems like the light, the color of the, of, of the rose color is, get, is getting wider and wider and deeper and deeper and it, it's spreading and the, and the sun is actually getting golder. It is getting a bright gold yellow color. It is gorgeous. We tried to record the miracle of the sun with our news camera, but as you can see, it did not capture the full vision. <laughs> Well, that, did that, you think Mary Lou got excited there? Yeah, I thought Mary Lou got a little excited. <laughs> but I've seen Mary Lou get excited before, and I mean, yeah. uh, I think that's one of the things that um, that we that we wanted to see. Mm -hmm. I mean, we wanted to see how this affected you. If in fact you're going to talk mm -hmm. about it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and let, let's follow that up because it's important. That, that that's an important part of the series, and it's important because. What we did after that was to take you to, to a doctor, mm -hmm. to an eye doctor, and, and the doctor ran tests on you, and if in fact you had looked at the sun for as long as, as, for 20 as minutes. say you had, mm -hmm. something would have happened That's to right. your eyes, but mm -hmm. nothing did. Well, within a matter of seconds, we should have had eye problems, mm -hmm. but burns from the sun. for as long as we looked at it, 
it would have been like, normally it would have been like shooting a laser into our eyes. We should be blind. Mm -hmm. We should be nothing left of our eyes. That was a fun experience. It was. It was, it was, it was, I mean, it was it, the most, I can say honestly, it is the most extraordinary thing that has ever happened to me and the most extraordinary and beautiful thing I have ever seen. You saw it, Jim? We saw almost identically oh, the same yeah, thing. In fact, yeah. when we were describing it there, we were both sitting right next to each That's other right. looking at the same thing. The, the artist the rendition time. that we saw on the tape was pretty close. It's good, but I'll be honest with you, there's no, I don't think there's any way to capture no, the exact image that, that occurred. Yeah, because you, you've got soft waves of color flowing out of the sun from all sides, and those colors grow richer and deeper and spread. The best way I can change. describe it is a thin, it would be almost looking like through a thin layer of colored ice. Mm -hmm. It's a very translucent but very powerful color at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to do a few other things before we have to go uh, uh, to another break. Well, we've got to go to another break. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're going to do that. When we come back, uh, we'll ask uh, Mary Lou and Jim about the place, Medjugorje, Yugoslavia, about the people, about the church, and about the state. Special newsmaker this Sunday, Jim Bailey and Mary Lou McCall, a program devoted to uh, their special, The Miracle of Medjugorje. Uh, before we left, I asked if we could uh, spend a few moments talking about the place. Mm -hmm. What kind of a place is Medjugorje? Is it as serene and peaceful as you would think and hope? You know, I mentioned earlier about the three uh, different religions that have been warring there almost since the, the nation was formed. The miracle, one of the biggest miracles, is the way this thing impacts on people's lives. In this very tense area of this country, in a very tense area of the world, this village is at total peace. The people no longer fight. Uh, they open their homes freely to anybody that wants to come. Uh, you walk down the street, knock on a door, and you're gonna, they'll give you wine, cheese, bread, even if they can't speak your language. That's right. The lady we stayed with, we asked her, isn't this burdensome? Because she's got literally crowds of people streaming in and out of her house every week. And she says, oh no. She says, Mary says that if you do something for someone, you get twice back. And she says she'd do anything for Mary, and that's how they feel. So, so you stayed with uh, in, in the home of, of uh, one of the, 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 the Medjugorje? Every, everyone yeah. does. There's no uh, Medjugorje help over there. No, 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 no. You, you stay, stay in, in the you home. You stay in the home. home. No Hyatt, huh? No Hyatt. No, no, no. Uh, what do people there do? Do they farm? Do they uh, raise sheep or something like that? What do they do? For the most part, they are farmers. They raise tobacco grapes, grapes they make into wine and, and, and other drinks for the most part. And they raise sheep and tobacco. And a lot of the men actually leave the village to work in nearby city. town. Yeah. In the time that we have left, and I think it's important, um, what, what sort of feeling did uh, this uh, story and the uh, program leave you with? It has had, it is, this story has had the most dramatic impact on my life. It has sent me away from Medjugorje with uh, with a new knowledge and a feeling of peace and I'm able to better handle the problems that are thrown at me in my life without the bitterness and the anger that I would have had before this story and I think it's made me a better person and I think that's the point of Medjugorje. Basically the, the same feeling, one of uh, complete peace and ability to handle the things yeah. you deal with and also in, in me a religion that I never had, a knowledge of God that I never had before. And we might say that if people want right. to hear the whole story, we couldn't tell it in a half hour yeah. anyway. We do speak in a number of churches uh, yeah. for free, there is no charge, yeah. and if they want us to, they can call. You leave with a great excitement and we're really excited. And we're going to leave now and we thank you for being with us on this special newsmaker. Okay. I'll see you next week. I'll be back. All right. Okay. You and I will be back. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks. Kirk.